Welcome back, mineralogy fans. It is time to meet the discontinuous mafic minerals here at the top of the Bowen's Reaction series. When a general melt is allowed to cool and crystallize, the first minerals on the discontinuous side to come out are olivine, then pyroxene, then amphibole. In general, minerals at the top of the Bowen's Reaction series crystallize from a melt first, melt from a solid last, and are less chemically stable at the surface. Olivine definitely fits this trend. Olivine is a nesosilicate, having islands of silica tetrahedra held together with ionic bonds by cations like iron or magnesium. Olivine has a non-metallic, vitreous luster, and its green color is consistent enough to be diagnostic. In fact, the name olivine comes from its olive green color. Though the specific gravity is slightly higher than average crustal minerals, coming in at around 3.3 compared to feldspar and quartz around 2.7, this difference is still too slight for most people to be able to distinguish just by handling the minerals, especially as they're composing rocks, though the density does increase with iron content in an olivine. This holds true for the density of our next minerals, pyroxene and amphibole as well, which have about the same specific gravity as olivine. The hardness of olivine is close to quartz, around 6.5 to 7, so it has no streak, and like quartz, has no cleavage, only generally conchoidal fracture. But unlike quartz, its crystal habit is usually just granular, having no definite shape in most igneous rocks it appears in. Abundant olivine and an igneous rock indicates an ultramafic chemistry, though not stable enough to be of much economic use except as a refractory mineral, which is a mineral used in metallurgy to strengthen alloys, and olivine is used for steel manufacture. At aesthetic endpoints, olivine can be used as a general abrasive, but it can also be a valuable gemstone called peridot. As olivine comes out of a melt, more silica-rich mix is left behind with a mafic chemistry. The next mineral after olivine to come out of the discontinuous branch of the Bowen's reaction series is pyroxene, which is a word that comes from the Greek for foreign fire, as these crystals were often seen as foreign impurities in volcanic glass. But we can see from Bowen's reaction series, it is just one of the first minerals to crystallize from a magma before it erupts onto the surface to make volcanic glass. As discussed previously, if two silica tetrahedra can share an oxygen corner, they reduce their total negative charge by two. Fewer iron and magnesium cations are needed to bind these silicate chains, but the ratio is still high enough to call pyroxene and amphibole ferromagnesian minerals. And when they bind the single chains together, they make pyroxene, a dark green to black mineral with a non-metallic vitreous luster, the hardness is 5 to 6, so it leaves a slight scratch on glass, and it will leave a streak which is often greenish-white. Pyroxene has two directions of cleavage at nearly right angles, 87-93, really. Instead of appearing as large, flat face cleavage planes, the cleavages on these minerals often appears as stair steps all parallel to each other, which can be discerned when you're rotating the sample and a bunch of small faces all reflect back at you at once. Mark each face that displays this characteristic, and you should find two directions at nearly 90 degree angles, which will make crystals that have what is called a prismatic crystal habit, that is, they tend to be rod or pencil shape, though often a bit stubby. Though very common in mafic igneous rocks, there is not much economic use for pyroxene on its own, though it can obviously be part of mafic building stone. There are gem quality varieties like spodumene, which can also be an ore for lithium, and jadeite, which is one of the two mineral varieties called jade. The Mayan and Aztec jade is all of this pyroxene type, and the Chinese is mostly of the other type, which we will meet in our next mineral, amphibole. One of the hardest distinctions for beginning students is telling amphibole from pyroxene, as they both have prismatic crystal habit, and due to having two directions of cleavage and dark green to black color. In fact, the name amphibole comes from the Greek for uncertain or doubtful, in reference to the difficulty in telling amphibole from pyroxene. The distinction comes in that the two directions of cleavage are not nearly at right angles, but closer to 60-120. 56, 124, really. 
Like the Pyrrhic scene, the cleavage is displayed in stair-stepping faces with parallel steps that all reflect back at once. Find your two directions of cleavage, and a quick check with your fingers will tell you if this is nearly at right angles for Pyrrhic scene or the nearly 6120 amphibole. Amphibole is also a 5 to 6 hardness, so it might weakly scratch glass, but unlike Pyrexene, its streak is colorless white to gray and does not have any green in it, typically. In theory, this makes it easy to tell the two apart, but in the field, it can be very difficult. So it is good to know something about how Pyrexene and Amphibole form to get their context because amphibole is principally an alteration mineral of pyroxene and water underground. We tend to find amphiboles in more silica-rich plutonic rocks, like cyanite or diorite, or metamorphic rocks, like the aptly named amphibolite, but it is rare to find amphibole in extrusive igneous rocks. Conversely, it is rare to find pyroxene in metamorphic rocks, with the majority of dark minerals in metamorphic gneiss or schist being amphibole, or maybe biotite, whereas most dark mineral matter in a mafic igneous mix is pyroxene. Like pyroxene, amphibole is not too economically useful on its own, only as part of decorative building stone, though like pyroxene it does have a variety that is also called jade. The jade of China and the Maori is traditionally nephrite a variety of amphibole. Being that nature does not like to be pigeonholed and can play up variations on a theme, amphibole has an older name, hornblend. We don't really use that anymore. Hornblend comes from the Germanic miners and it meant to dazzle, as its reflective dark surfaces can look almost metallic, yet it yields no metal. Ambiguous amphibole can also form long, fiber-like threads. Any minerals with this crystal habit gets put in the category of asbestos, and some is more harmful to our lungs than others. Asbestos has been used for heat protection for centuries. The Romans called it linum vivum, or the linen of life, as they'd weave the threads of amphibole needles together into a mat that was laid over a body to be cremated. When the fire ran its course, the fabric would be untouched, and all the cremated ashes would be kept underneath. Yeah, you don't want that stuff blowing all over town. I guess Charlemagne had a tablecloth of asbestos, too, which was a pretty cool party trick. You could spill anything you wanted on the mineral fabric and then throw it in the fire to clean it. Now most of our asbestos, which is used in brakes and fire-resistant materials, comes from serpentine. But the first used was amphibole. And so we've covered the mafic end of the Bowen's reaction series, and we have met the main minerals at its felsic base. So we finish off Bowen's reaction series with the remaining middle micas in our coming mineralogical meeting.